This church looks very ordinary, but it's got something very special inside. So let's take a look. But before we do, I think we need some epic music. Maybe Zadok the Priest is a little bit over dramatic, but I wanted to capture just how impressive these are when you first see them, especially for the 15th century congregation who would have been the original viewers. To a largely illiterate population, these stories from the Bible and from the lives of saints would have struck fear and awe into their hearts and been an essential part of the medieval Christian life. Now, Pickering's church contains one of only five surviving sets of medieval paintings in churches, so we're going to take a really detailed look at them. Now, unfortunately, because I'm small, it's hard to get a really detailed image of these pictures, but there are actually HD images available in the guidebook, which I've taken pictures of and then which I'm going to put on the Facebook page. We start with St George slaying the dragon, who would become a favourite saint of both the Anglo-Saxons and the Normans. Then we have the story of St Christopher carrying the child Jesus across a river. St Christopher is at the entrance of the church as he is a patron saint of travellers. Notice the snakes wrapped around his foot, which brings to mind Genesis. Then we have St John the Baptist. He opposed King Herod's marriage to Herodias as she was the wife of his brother and Herod was already married. Salome, Herod's daughter, was dancing and Herod said that Salome could have anything she wanted. Salome, being young, asked Herodias, who told her to ask for the head of St John the Baptist on a plate. Here we see the full story being told. Above this scene is a scene showing the crowning of Mary and her assumption into heaven. Here we see the graphic martyrdom of St Edmund. King of East Anglia, he refused to renounce his Christian faith and was shot with arrows by an invading Viking army in 870 AD. If we look at the uniforms of the archers, we can date this to the mid-15th century. If you look closely at the archer in red on the bottom left, you may notice he's painted in a slightly different style. This is because this painting was damaged and so was restored in a pre-Raphaelite style by the Victorians. Moving on, we have the martyrdom of St Thomas a Becket. A close friend of Henry II, he infamously came to a sticky end when he fell out with Henry II over the state's involvement with the church. And Henry reportedly cried out, Will no one rid me of this turbulent priest? To which four of his knights took off and promptly killed Thomas at Canterbury Cathedral. If you look at the armour of the knights, they are wearing the armour of Edward IV, and so we can date this as being painted between 1461 and 1483. Moving on to the other side, we have the martyrdom of St Catherine. The patron saint of philosophers, she converted to Christianity and could be any philosopher who was sent to debate her. Eventually, the emperor got so tired of having his best philosophers beaten by her, so he had her killed. She was tortured on a spiked wheel, from which we get the firework, the Catherine wheel. Next, we have something slightly different, the seven corporal or bodily works of mercy. This is hugely important, as in 1281 it was considered to be part of the core of a child's education, one of their GCSEs. Drawn from various passages in the Bible, they are considered the main charitable duties in the physical world. Feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, sheltering the stranger, clothing the naked, visiting those imprisoned, tending to the sick, and burying the dead. Finally, we come to the Passion and Crucifixion of Christ, which is sort of a culmination and climax to all the different stories which have preceded. Now, this is shown in detail with all the major episodes in the Gospel stories shown. Then we have the descent into hell, with the sinners marching into a beast's mouth. You've got to imagine the terror that this would have inspired in someone in the Middle Ages when they're looking at this. The figure to the left is Adam holding an apple, and next to him is Eve, the first two sinners. Finally, we come to the resurrection of Jesus, and it almost forms a cycle with the resurrection image being an image of hope against the darkness and terror of hell. 
Medieval churches, monasteries and cathedrals would have been full of things like this, but during the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, scores of religious art were removed or destroyed. This is because it was believed that they were idolatrous. They distracted people from worship and were banned in the Bible. Throughout the 16th and 17th centuries, countless pieces of artwork all over the country were defaced or hidden, including these wall paintings. At some point during the Reformation, they were plastered over and would remain hidden for centuries. These paintings were discovered in 1852 when plaster was removed from the wall. Although these paintings were uncovered, the vicar at the time didn't like them, believing them to be full of popish superstitions, and so he ordered them to be covered up again. In 1876, with the new vicar, they were uncovered again, but the process of covering and uncovering them had damaged the fragile paintings. Restoration work started, and in 1895 they were finally finished, restored to their former glory. Let's look at the church itself. The first church to stand on this site was built during the Anglo-Saxon times, but all that remains of this early church is the bowl of the stone font, which is believed to have been damaged during the English Civil War. Most of the church we now see was built by the Normans in the 12th century, but like most churches it was continually built on over time. Notice first the Norman features, the simple fat columns with carved capitals and round arches, and compare this to the opposite side, where we see far more complex columns, the start of what's called composite columns, which show that there was increasing complexity in carving as time went on. Let's move upwards through the nave and into the rest of the church. Here we have an effigy of Sir William Bruce, who played an important role in the later development of the church. This late 18th century pulpit is rather unusual in that it has a cylindrical shape, however the octagonal base is modern. Entering the chancel, it's simple and spacious. The reodos is from 1930 and the chancel screen is from 1927. It has a wonderful carved wooden panelling which always makes me think of Tudor houses. There's also a medieval piscina and sedilia, both 14th century, and an unusual memorial to Americans. Two men from Pickering helped survey Washington DC and thus helped found the city, and underneath it is a plaque to the alliance between America and Britain in the First World War and the American servicemen who served. By the south side of the chancel, is a beautiful little chapel containing two effigies of Sir and Dame Rucliffe, who lend their name to this chapel. The stained glass windows contain a very small monk who is difficult to spot, and maybe my favourite thing about this chapel is the really nice smell. This has been a brief guide to the Church of St Peter and Paul in Pickering. Now obviously you can't really get the full beauty of it unless you go see it yourself, but for a lot of you obviously that's quite difficult, and so the aim and purpose of these videos are to be a virtual tour of historical churches, so for those of you who can't visit these places you can at least get a glimpse of their beauty and majesty. So I hope that you found this video interesting and hope to see you again soon.